stand or kneel along the railings and you'll receive the sign of the cross and then a blessing with the laying on of hands. Uh, totally optional. And that will be at the beginning now of this service. We ask that uh, when you come forward, when the uh, assistant is um, approached you, that you would share the, your name with them uh, so we can use your name in the blessing. And with that, let us open with prayer. Good and gracious God, we come today with our, with our burdens and our wounds and our hopes and our dreams. And we lift them up to you, assured of your healing power and assured of your promise to manifest in us the greatest possibilities. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us begin with our gathering hymn. Please stand. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We gather to hear the word of God, pray for healing of every kind, spiritual, physical, and emotional, and ask God's blessing for health and wholeness through Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Great God, our healer, by your power, the Lord Jesus healed and gave hope. As we gather in his name, look upon us with mercy and bless us with your healing spirit. Bring us comfort in the midst of pain, strength to transform our weakness, and light to illuminate our darkness. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us sing, say the prayer of healing responsibly. Lord, grant your healing grace to all who are sick, injured, or disabled, that they may be made whole. Yes. Mend broken relationships and restore those in emotional distress to soundness of mind and serenity of spirit. Restore to wholeness whatever is broken in our lives, in this nation, and in the young world. Hear us, O Lord of life. Hear us, O Lord of life. Hear us, 
You may be seated at this time. Sisters and brothers, I invite you to receive the sign of healing and wholeness in the name of Jesus Christ. At this time, while we're singing, you may uh, come forward and, as I said, may kneel or stand along the railing and you will receive uh, the blessing of healing.
I invite you to please stand and receive the blessing. Almighty God, who is a strong tower of all, to whom all things in heaven and on earth bow and obey, we be now and evermore your sure defense and help you to know that the name given to us for health and salvation is the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Please take this time to share the peace with one another. The first lesson is from the 50th chapter of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. 
Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. I Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. In order to preserve a numerous, a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all their possessions, and pay as payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. May be seated, and I invite the children to come forward. Hello, morning. You guys seem sleepy this morning. Is it because it's so dark out? Yeah. Well, I have a question. So do you like to go outside and run and yell and jump around and play? You like to do that? Yeah? So when you do that, um, do you think you breathe faster or slower than you're breathing right now? Faster. And... What do you think would happen if you went outside and you ran around and you were yelling and playing and, and you did all of that trying to hold your breath? Do you think it would work? 
No, probably not. You know, do you know why? What do we need? Air. Air. Yeah, we need to breathe, right? So we just kind of naturally breathe more, need more air when we do more. And so I want you to keep you in that mind, that in mind, that sometimes in order to do one thing, we need more of another thing. And now I want to talk about the story that Jesus told. As he tells a story about this uh, king who had a servant that owed him a ton of money, just lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. And the king forgives him. He couldn't pay for it. He begged for forgiveness, and the king gave it to him. He said, it's okay that you can't give me back that money. In fact, let's just forget about it, and you don't ever have to pay me back. Okay? That was pretty nice of the king, right? It's pretty nice. But later on, the man runs into another man who owes him a little bit of money. And he won't forgive him any of the money he he is owed. And he puts the man in jail and is really mean. And this news gets to the king, and he didn't really like that. Because he said, I forgave you a whole lot, and you couldn't forgive this other person a little bit. Now I want you to remember about breathing, right? To do one thing, you need more of another. You need more air to run around. Well, it's the same thing with this story. To forgive, we need to remember that we are forgiven. This man didn't remember And they didn't end very well for him. But I think that's why Jesus told us that story, is to remind us to remember the forgiveness we've been given so that we forgive others. Because that's not as easy as breathing faster is for us when we run around. Um, But it's the same idea. We need more forgiveness to forgive. So let's pray. You repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who teaches us about who teaches us about how to forgive us so that we can forgive others. Amen. You have a seat. Today I want to talk to you about the book of Genesis. Genesis is a book that's filled with creation stories, really, and the stories of blessed families. And those blessed families have lots of issues. The book of Genesis begins with a story of creation and of Adam and Eve messing up. And when they mess up, God shows up. And though they face the consequences of the choices that they make and life is changed forevermore, they are still loved. And God goes with with them as they live on in their new normal. You read on in the book of Genesis, and you encounter a couple named Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham and Sarah were promised a family that would change the world and right the wrongs that were occurring in God's good creation. But they had no child. And when Abraham was feeling the most uh, doubtful and defeated and depressed about this, God shifts his perspective by showing him all the stars in the universe and assuring him that God is trustworthy and creator and a promise keeper 
for he will his family will indeed be as great as the stars that he sees in the sky. Well, Abraham hangs on to that promise, and eventually he and Sarah have a son, and they name him Isaac. And then Isaac has twins, twin sons named Jacob and Esau. And Isaac loved Esau, and his wife loved Jacob. These blessed families of the Bible, as you read their stories, you realize are just as dysfunctional, if not more so, than our own families today. Through the journey of lies and wrestling and blessings, Jacob comes to have 12 sons. And like his parents did, he loves one of his sons better than all the rest. It's his second youngest son, Joseph. And he gives Joseph this fancy coat, which is a sign that Joseph was being groomed not to do manual labor like his 11 brothers, but to be a manager, to be the boss, which was odd because it was culturally accepted that the oldest would run the family business, not the second youngest. But Reuben, who is the oldest, is out of favor with his dad because you read in chapter 35 of the book of Genesis that he's had an affair with one of dad's wives. Joseph was a jerk. He was a jerk about being the favorite. He had a tendency to lord it over his brothers whenever he could. And because of this, his brothers hated him. And so they schemed to kill him. Now Reuben, the oldest, who's out of favor with dad, maneuvers to compromise and convince his brothers to stick Joseph into a pit rather than kill him in the hopes that they would cool off and he could go back and free Joseph from the pit when they had left you can guess that Reuben was thinking about himself not his little brother if he saved Joseph he might get back into good favor with good old dad but the opportunity comes to sell Joseph into slavery. And when this knocks on the brothers' doors, offering more income than they ever could make as shepherds, they succumb to the temptation. They lie to their father that his favorite son is dead. They get rid of their arrogant, pain-in-the-neck little brother. And they get rich. So Joseph ends up in Egypt, where he experiences many ups and downs. He works in the house of a government official, where he is recognized for his intelligence and his skills as a good manager. And then he's falsely accused of assault and thrown into prison. But word of his ability to interpret dreams comes to the ears of Pharaoh, who's having nightmares that no one can explain to him. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams and discerns that a famine was coming. And with that warning, Egypt is able to prepare for this famine, and Joseph is set in charge of the distribution, and he goes from one prison hole to the next, Joseph always rises to great power from pit to palace. 
Now, during the famine, Joseph's brothers go to Egypt for help, for resources. And they are reunited with their brother, Joseph. A big surprise. And understandably, they are really scared. Yet Joseph is merciful, even though when you consider that his brothers never actually ask for forgiveness. Rather, they do what is their nature, and they try to manipulate it out of him by saying that Dad says you should forgive us, Joseph, for the wrong that we did and the way that we treated you. But Joseph sees through that deception. Joseph has the power to destroy his brother's lives forever. And instead, he weeps because deep down, he still loved his family. How can Joseph do that? Joseph knows in his heart of heart that though they planned something bad for him and their intentions were for his harm, God brought about greater good, something that saved many lives behind whatever they were doing underneath everything that was happening. God was doing something good. God was making everything right again. This idea of God uh, doing something good out of our struggles is something that also can be misunderstood. Right? Because when you think about it, isn't that saying that God planned our suffering? And that feels manipulative, and it feels abusive. Why would God plan such things? Is that really how God works? But actually, the story of Joseph is not saying that at all. That's not what it's saying. God did not plan the ups and downs, the pits, moments of Joseph's lives, his sufferings, or ours. That is sin's plan. Joseph's brothers made choices. God did not force them to sell Joseph into slavery in order for some divine puppet show to proceed. Remember Adam and Eve? They made a choice to break the one rule that they were given in paradise. They ate of the tree of knowledge and evil, even though they knew that they were not to do it, and as a consequence, life changed. They knew things that would cause them suffering and sorrow, and they did them anyway. But when they messed up, God showed up. God took care of them, clothed them, fed them, <coughs> provided for them. And then God went with them wherever they went. That's how that story ends in the book of Genesis. And God was with them wherever they went. They were not abandoned. God's plan is what gets us through the mess-ups, through our mistakes, through our sufferings, through our pit moments, to reach our divine potential. God, our creator, is steadfast love, a God of promise, a promise keeper. And the promise is to see us through the pit to the palace. And Joseph knew that. He'd lived that. He'd experienced that by now. And it was not God's plan to make Joseph a slave. Yet Joseph's skills as a manager, his intelligence, his gifts were what enabled him and were enabled by God 
to save Egypt and his brothers who sold Joseph into slavery in the first place. Joseph was a dreamer. He dreamed of having great power and his brothers bowing down to him. And this happened, but not in the form that he imagined it would happen. But it still happened because his dream was also in line with God's dream for him. He dreamed of running the family business, but God expanded that dream, and instead he ran a nation. Listen to your dreams. Listen to when God enters into your dreams. How have rough patches and hard times in your life inspired hope? How have you been strengthened in your abilities? How have you been encouraged to persevere in your dreams? For God hears our prayers. God is listening. So tell your dreams to God and then pray for God to manifest them even beyond what you can imagine at this time. For God is listening, and God has the power to transform those dreams, to transform your trials, and keep you on the path of the dreams that are also God's dreams for you. For we are worthy of love and belonging, and we can stop hiding. For love finds you and is with you wherever you go. For God knows you, searches you, and blesses you. God enables us to forgive, and in forgiveness we open a future that the past unforgiveness had closed off to us. God heals our brokenness. For God shows up when the going gets tough, heals and repairs when the damage is already done, and sees us through the pit to the palace. Amen.
to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Good and gracious God, we pray for the church. Bless the ministries of congregations in our community. Unite us in the proclamation of your life-giving gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, you spoke light into being, and you separated the waters. You formed the dry land. Protect and enliven the creation that you so love, and make us willing partners in its care. Lord, in your mercy. God of the nations, you love all tribes, all peoples, and all languages. We pray for all who govern. Give them wise and generous hearts for those that they serve. Lord, in your mercy. Divine healer, calm the anxiety of those who are wrongly accused, who suffer under crushing debt, or who are in prison. Reassure those who are lonely, impatient, brokenhearted, homebound, hospitalized, or ill. Especially, we pray for Matt Henry, Chris Snyder, Kathy Kutzer, and Dana. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this assembly, for our guests and our visitors, for newcomers to this community, for those who are certain and for those who are in doubt, and for all who seek you in this place. Lord, in your mercy. We remember and give thanks for the faithful of every age who did not live to themselves, but lived to you. Especially, we remember Jan Schnath. Raise us with them on that last day. Lord, in your mercy. And gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting the power of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. May be seated for this time of sharing of our gifts.
these gifts on the earth. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should in all times give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for judge justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim that Christ's death, until he comes, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. We join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of this resurrection, we might live in freedom and hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, creator, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. I always forget the Lord's Prayer comes after this. There's a reason for that. For two years now, the Lord's Prayer came at the end of the prayers, and we would go into the Lord's Prayer, and then we would do communion. That's why I do that. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. 
Now you may be seated. The meal is prepared, and all are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. You'll receive the bread and then a glass of either the dark liquid, which is wine, or the light liquid, which is grape juice. And there are gluten-free elements available. You let the server know. You may kneel or stand along the railing. Come, let us eat.
Please stand as you are able. Receive the blessing of communion. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Holy and compassionate God, in bread and wine, you give us gifts that form us to be humble and courageous. May your words come to life in our serving and in our witness, that we might speak a living voice of healing and justice to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated for announcements. Do you have some to give? All right. Um, reminder, photo directory pictures are being taken today, and I believe those are in the fellowship hall. Um, they'll be taken until 1.30 today, so please uh, go and get your picture taken for our directory. Also, longtime member Jan Schnaff did pass away this week. There will be a memorial service and an upcoming date to be determined here at Messiah, so the Messiah family may celebrate her life. And uh, I believe you're talking about next week? Uh, the end of the month. What? The forums. Yes. Okay. I'll let you go. That is next week. It is next week. Okay. It works. Okay. All right. Um, Everybody here that's a member should have gotten a letter and a big packet of information to read in the mail this last week. If you did not, please contact the church office. Um, as many of you have heard, we have this uh, last year, a uh, group was formed, Vision and Mission 2.0, a long-range planning team, and they have done incredible work. Um, that large report that you got is a synopsis of all of their work. Um, and the purpose of the forums that are next weekend um, and we made one adjacent to each worship service, so nobody has to make a special trip for this. We want to make it convenient. Please read that information and come. This is discussing uh, the, all of the information that is included in there, and it is an important stepping stone in our process towards getting ready to call a pastor. So please read that information, be informed, and then come, and we can discuss any questions you may have. Oh, and then... The next week, I mean, that's, you know, we're all split up to three different spots, and we thought it was important to have us all together. So Reformation Sunday is going to be a big day, so we'll be having an all-together time, but it will be tied in with a, a nice dinner to, to celebrate the Reformation. My name is David Seward, and I want to say thank you. As you can see in the parking lot, there are four dumpsters full. It was incredible. Very few people from the church showed up, but those who did brought what they had and showed up and did a wonderful job. We had, I'll have a full report with how many bodies showed up and how many trucks and all that sort of stuff, but we cleaned a neighborhood. Thank you very much. As another reflection of Messiah's um, living out some of its uh, uh, vision statements, as I see them in the window over there, um, of serving the community, Messiah has been nominated by the Council of Churches of the Ozarks for an award at their fifth annual Celebrate Compassion Recognition Dinner, September 28th, 6 to 8 p.m., and uh, we've sponsored a table, and so if you 
uh, volunteer in any way with the outreach ministries of uh, CCO, Crossline, Safe to Sleep, Ambassadors for Children, there's lots of others, or just would be interested in attending this, um, please let us know in the office by Thursday, September 21st. It's at the Ramada Oasis Convention Center and doors open at 5.30. So uh, it'd be nice to have a, a representative presence there from our congregation in case we uh, win. So um, thank you for your service. Receive the blessing now. Please stand. Now may the power of God strengthen you, may the love of Jesus Christ heal you, and may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you, now and forever. Amen. messages for thee. Guided by the gospel, we welcome all to worship. Go in peace, serve the Lord.